All right. So this is the fifth day of um, D for Miss. So I'm really excited to get started. Thank you for everyone joining us. I'm Amy Moles, um, host of the D for Miss podcast. And uh, we are here with Manny from Bitminds. So Manny, can you just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your um, how you got started in digital forensics? Yeah, sure. So I'm Manny Kressel. Uh, some of you might know me from uh, conferences. I started in digital forensics back in 2006 when I was with Gwinnett County Police Department. Uh, I was working the road and then I was in detectives and we had uh, one of the officers leave and go uh, work work corporate. So I was kind of like next up in the list. So they asked me to go into the lab and then uh, I was in there for a little bit, got trained by Secret Service, NW3C, went for those classes. Um, uh, Secret Service was to me that was the I was the biggest plus. So I I was in there uh, for pretty much the rest of my career there at Gwinnett County, and then um, since then I I moved on. And then in 2018 I started Bitmines with the intent to provide like the best custom hardware, best you know solutions out there for people to process you know data, do DFIRs fast as they possibly can. So right now I'm in my 17th year in forensics. Wow. Yeah. So you've seen it all. It's, I've seen time fly by. <laughs> I mean, we were still, we still had floppy. We still had floppy drives in the machines when I was there. That's so funny. Floppy drives. So tell me a little bit about this holiday sweater. Where did you oh, get it? Yeah. I had to go a little bit crazy. I had to go a little bit overboard just because that's kind of how I am with stuff. I, <laughs> I sewed in lights. I got an M here for Manny. I got these sleighs on the side here with like the candy canes. I'm not going to lie. You look like a Christmas transformer. Yeah, right? I love I it. Look at that. I said yesterday, I felt like Emperor Ming from Flash Gordon. Like when I was, <laughs> when I was growing up, like Flash Gordon, anytime that came on HBO, I was watching it. But yeah, yeah, I, I changed. I changed my little sign out because um, I know that your wife has her own coffee company, so it says right. "Fa la la latte." Right. And like right before the show, my "la la latte" fell all over the place, so it oh. was really great. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was like right, right. so appropriate. <laughs> yeah. So awesome! Well, I love the holiday spirit. I think it's great. This is probably one of the best sweaters I've seen. So congrats. Yeah, um, so in terms of some of the trends that we're seeing in 2023, can you kind of talk through what the, I guess, what you're seeing in terms of a hardware related perspective? Yeah, for me, it's, it's kind of an existing problem and it's, and it's been an issue for a while now, but I, I think just the volume of data that examiners are facing to process and get through efficiently in order to get results out to, you know, other detectives or customers, whatever field you're in. That just seems to be the the reoccurring theme that I see over and over again. And I, and I hear people talking about over and over again, like uh, Apple just released the iPhone 15 in September. And I think, I think you can get a two terabyte now, but I mean, I was talking to some, I was talking to some folks at the last conference and they said, a lot of the rips they're getting now, the phones are like 256 gigs of, you know, a, a file size for them to, to go through. So not only is it like the time that it takes to to acquire the data, you know, then you then you have processing time. So it's to me, it's the reoccurring theme is just what do you what do you do with all this data, whether you're triaging it or whether you have to like pick and choose what you think or and it, you know, from being in law enforcement, some agencies have a policy of you know, they get just a certain number of images or a certain number of videos, you know, if you're working CSAM and, and then that's it, like they, they're cut off. But if you have to provide all, you know, if your agency says, give us everything, I mean, you're kind of stuck. You don't know what you're going to get. I'm, I'm putting, sometimes I'm putting 20 terabyte drives in these systems. I can only imagine if somebody goes to Walmart and they buy a 20 terabyte drive and you go out and serve a search warrant and you're sitting with like two or three of those phones. Like you, you have to have some you have to have some kind of solution in place to handle all of it. Yeah, so we talk to a lot of people and their pain point is always data processing. So I are you uh facing that from a different perspective when you're building these machines? Like how are you I mean, obviously you don't have to give us the secret sauce, but like 
How are you, how are you combating that? Well, I've always said, um, or not always, but even when I was in my lab, what I tried to do is I would have like certain machines that would make the images. And while those machines were making images, I would be processing the images from the other machines or process those like EO ones or whatever files, you know, whatever you use. Some people don't use compression. Some people do. Sometimes it's a DD, but I would use one machine to process another machine to make images. And it now, thankfully, I mean, we have, there's a lot of disc imagers out there, like the various companies that make all the imaging devices out there that are just standalone. To me, I've, I've mentioned to customers, like it makes sense to buy, you know, a, a $3,500 device or, you know, some of them are more expensive, like a $10,000 device, make all your images with that, move all that data over to your machines and use the, use the machines to process that data. So I've told customers too, you know, sometimes to me, it, it makes sense if you have enough to buy one really big machine, buy like three individual machines. That way you can do like phones on one, disk images on another, maybe leave the other one open for, you know, GPS vehicle forensics, something like that. So in I this case, it, sharing is caring. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it's a, I think it's a good way or, at least for now, short of short of crafting, you know, short of crafting the machines so that they'll process the data fast. Like you have to have some methodology to, to deal with it. Like if if you dump two or three terabytes worth of data on a machine and it's just sitting and churning for days on end, you're you're kind of stuck. Like you can't stop it. It has to finish. It has to process. So you got to get yeah. the results. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of times these, the timeline to get results is so small too. So right. I think a lot of individuals, um, when they hear us talking about it and they aren't performing the casework themselves, they're like, uh, okay, well, you just sit there and when, when it's done processing, you get to it when you get to it. It's like, nope. Sometimes people's no. lives are on the lines or oh, yeah. there's a dangerous situation where you need to remove somebody from that. Um, right. There's a lot of different reasons why people need it quickly. So oh, yeah. making the machines that you're making to process that and to handle that data flow, I think is super important. Yeah. And that's one of the things I focus on is, is making sure that there's, and I've pretty much moved away from rotational disks. I mean, I, I still, I'll still put like an 18 terabyte drive in a machine just so you can store data and have a repository to store images and, and whatnot. But I've, I've kind of moved away and just gone all solid state. Like that's just the way to go regardless of what you're using for processing, like, you know, if you're whatever, whatever you're using for your forensic tools, like it's just going to run faster on solid state NVMe rated NVMe rated SSD. Yeah, absolutely. So in terms of like specific hardware technologies, what do you like, what's your prediction and what's essential in digital forensics? Um, I think personally, like speed and power is what you're going to need. I, I kind of feel like encryption is also going to get big. Like, I mean, we all know, like in order to get through some of these phones, you got to have something to break through the encryption. Then you're dealing with the size of the, you know, the size of the file that, that comes out the other side that you're left with. So I think, in, I think encryption is going to be, I mean, to me, I mean, I'm getting, I'm getting requests for quotes on, you know, encryption, like decryption engines. I was just going to ask if that's something that you work on. Oh yeah. Yeah. We have everything from, and I kind of like them. We have everything from just a little small box that you can use that'll, you know, I started putting in the 40 nineties as soon as they came out, but, and they're running, I mean, with a zip file, which I know is it's, it's kind of cheating a little bit because zip files run really fast, but with like a single 40 90, I'm getting 16 million password, you know, temps per second. Can you kind of, so just for um, the audience that's listening, that might not be as technical. Can you kind of tell us the difference when you say 4090, what is that? And then what was, oh, yeah. what was the speed before? Right, right. Um, so it, I usually, I pretty much always use NVIDIA cards in the machines and right now they're in the 4000 series. So they're at, um, well, so there's a 4060, 4070, 4080 and a 4090, 4090 is at the high end before that. It was um, 
the thirty the three thousand series. So the thirty ninety was like the king of the cards. So you usually want to go for like the top, like you go for the top card just because it'll process more, it'll attempt more passwords per second than let's say something like a forty eighty or a forty seventy. Like if you're serious about decryption, you go with like the high end card. So for a thirty ninety, I think they were doing like roughly eleven million on a zip file. Whereas now the forty ninety, it's it's uh, it, I mean it'll be a it's a solid sixteen million per second. That's insane. Which is good, and I like the little smaller. I like the smaller chassis just because you know some agencies they don't have a ton of money, and they need a solution. Like we can't just have you know suspects running loose and you know that that need to be off the street. So if they don't have a lot of money, I like the little system because. You can use it for decryption. It's a small, you know, little box. And then when you're not using it for decryption, you can use it as another processing engine to process all your data. And then it's cheaper. You know, some of these, some of these solutions, I mean, I just built some over the summer. Uh, an agency wanted eight. They're called RTX 6000 ADA cards. They're way super advanced, but they're, they're 5,000 a piece. They got eight cards in the box, so you're talking forty grand just for the cards alone, not including the hardware. So, I like making a solution that, you know, an agency that doesn't have a lot of money, they yeah. can buy something. They'll have just something that they can use. Yeah, the lab that I used to work in had a decryption box, and I think we had a few of them, and it was fifty thousand dollars. But oh, yeah. they had the budget to support that, so I can't imagine right. a small um, law enforcement department would have that type of money to spend on just one machine that might right. be their whole tech budget for the year yeah exactly so yeah. i try to give them something i try to give them something that they can use you know it i like to use it, the word multi-purpose but you know it's nice for them to have at least something without having you know the giant like you said giant tech budget so when you're building the machines out, because you're building them for multi-purpose, obviously they're like an open platform so they can have any type of OS on there, right? Oh, yeah. And then yeah, they can choose whatever software they want to run on it. So it's not restricted um, or anything along those lines. Yes. Yeah, that's that's true. Yeah. I'll, some customers want Linux. Some people, you know, some examiners, they don't have much experience with Linux, so they don't. They don't really care. Most of the time, I'm I'm still installing Windows 10. I have like a giant stack of Windows 10 disks, so that's for the most part that's what everybody's still still going with. But yeah, Linux. I get customers that are big into that. You get so like, is there? Go ahead. Sorry. No, oh, I I saw he's going to be on the show if he wasn't already. But you get like the Aaron Sparling types. It's just the coding guru, and he's he's just scripting away at Linux. You know. <laughs> Yeah, and I think the majority of the software that's supported in digital forensics is Windows based too. So I think that that um, we see that a lot, right? That trend. But I have some experience. There's um, there's a there's a new tool coming out that uh, runs off of Linux, and it's 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 pretty fast. It doesn't have a lot of the overhead that Windows does. Oh, okay. So Linux might, I feel like, might become more popular. Are you I'm allowed to say what it is? The the software yeah <laughs> nbf tools okay yeah ha, do you uh, have you uh tried it out or oh have yeah you have an experience you like it yeah i put it on a machine just a simple machine it's you know i think the machine like the cost to build it was like four thousand dollars and it what was, is the cost normally i mean it's like probably a, a range right obviously for, depending on what you need <laughs> yeah for like a just like a regular I'm going to call it regular, but like a, a multi-purpose, like full functioning system. I usually like to tell people like, for me, I like eight, eight thousand, eighty five hundred, maybe less if you don't need a lot of graphics power. The graphics okay. cards are a lot of the times what, 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 you know, like what, what the big cost is, is the graphics cards. Because a forty nine, a forty ninety, like we were talking about before, I mean, it's two thousand dollars, eighteen hundred dollars. Yeah. But you can yeah. you can run a lab just fine on a forty seventy Ti, forty eighty. I mean, some people want more horsepower, but I mean, who doesn't, right? Right, right. 
Uh, more power. Yeah. <laughs> more power, more better. No. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so in yeah. terms of like computing architectures and hardware designs, where do you like the overall impact um, going into digital forensic case processing into 2024? Where do you think, like, what do you think that's going to look like or? Yeah. I mean, I've always said, cause here's the thing. Like when we started out in our lab, we were just, they, they, I like to call it, it was, I think it was a retrofitted storage closet. Might've been a janitor's closet, but they didn't have the little sink at the bottom. You know, that they always drain the buckets out in, but you know, like a lot the step of up. Us, yeah, right. A lot of us are in labs that are super small. So I've always said, I like to make the machines as small as you possibly can to fit as much equipment in that machine so that one, you can have like those multiple systems in, in a lab. Maybe you, maybe you run off two or three machines, or maybe you have that like standard $8,000 one. And then, you know, you have a couple smaller systems that you can run like side cases on. So I, I kind of, I'm saying that because I, I kind of feel like and I don't know, maybe I'm just trying to steer this trend that way, but smaller, going going smaller. Like I, I have a new system I'm working on now that's it's about the size of a shoebox. You know, when I was out there this year uh, in the, at the conferences, I had one that I put a loaf of bread next to, and I kind of used that as my inspiration to make this new machine. But the new machine I have has like, it has handles on the top so you can pick it up and carry it around. But it's- Oh, nice. It, yeah, it's literally like just a little bit bigger than a loaf of bread. A big size loaf, but So did you have a specific target in mind when you were when you built that machine? Yeah, yeah, I mean, so there's a lot of there's there's a lot of examiners out there now that are doing um uh like video forensics. Uh I think it's uh, it's Leva law enforcement video analysts. There's a there's a group of them and to me, they, they do like, they just process mostly all video. I mean, I say that kind of loosely, like, I know that's not all they do, but like, they're But the majority part. of their casework is that. Right. Yeah. So I designed that small box because I figure they may be stuffed in a small little cubicle. They may be in a, a, a small room, but I wanted that small box to be able to handle a 4090, which I don't know if you've ever seen one, but they're like, they're almost like the size of a skateboard. They're crazy big, like. They're huge graphics cards. So I wanted that machine to be able to house a 4090 in it and still be fully functional. Like the board I put in, it has three NVMEs on it. And then I'm having it designed where I can put four SSDs inside of it. So storage-wise, capacity-wise, it's going to be like the storage powerhouse. It'll have, you know, like the latest Intel. I can still put liquid cooling in it. So it's kind of a trend to me is... For hardware based, I think smaller is better. Like some of these these big machines out there, they're, they're the size of a small refrigerator. You know, like some people don't have all the room to have big machines. You don't want to be shoulder to shoulder to your machines. Yeah, right. <laughs> all, all crammed in a all crammed in a small space in a lab. <laughs> no, I can't imagine the heat too. Oof. Right. We used to, um, the office I used to work out of was really small and we would have these massive forensic machines and it was so warm in there that they actually gave us one of those portable AC units to put in there just to cool down the room because it would, <laughs> I mean, I'm cold all the time. I live in Florida. So I was like, oh, I love this. This is nice. I'm warm, toasty. It's a nice balmy 88 degrees in here. It's perfect working conditions, but for everyone else on my team, they hated it. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, we had one at Gwinnett. We it had to vent into the ceiling because we had AC in there, but we had a server in there, two machines, other machines that were running, that were ripping data. Like it, it was constantly hot in there. Yeah. The only time you turned the AC off was like at Christmas time. And then I don't think ours ever turned off. Heaters. Right. Unless you needed to have like a quiet moment where you had to turn it off so you could actually hear each other in the same room, but I think it ran all the time because it's so warm in there. Yeah. 
No, okay. we could. I can't agree with you more on the smaller size. Obviously, like Atro is a tiny, tiny little thing. Um, sure, but we yeah. built it so that it's portable, it's accessible. People can take it with them wherever they want. They can plug it in the car. They can. It's made for on scene triage. So, um, yeah, we a hundred percent agree that that's where it should go, like, yeah. trend wise. It's funny because I feel like cell phones kind of do the same thing. It's like we went really small, then we went really big, then we went really small. Yeah. Of course, I always go for the biggest iPhone. I always go for the Mac, so. <laughs> I would look ridiculous with the Plus. I feel like it would take up like half my head. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, well, you seem to have like a really wide range of experience. So people going into digital forensics professionally, where should they start? What advice can you give them? Oh, my. I, I mean, I would definitely like if you're not law enforcement, the 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 good thing about law enforcement, they have, I mean, there's a nice path there with, you know, NW3C and IASIS and, you know, the variety of other classes, like what Jessica Hyde offers with, at Hexordia, like there's a variety of classes and even, even like her classes for, you know, a non-law enforcement entity. If you, if you can't get, you know, local training at a, a community college, that's probably the best avenue. You know, there's a lot of stuff out there online that you can look at that are, some tutorials that are out there from a lot of the examiners you and I know that have been in the industry a long time and they're starting to put stuff out on YouTube and, you know, just start watching it, start learning. I mean, the one thing, the one thing I, the one book I purchased that really saved me and really helped me understand was, was, uh, Brian Carrier's file system forensics. Oh like yeah. I, I mean, we, we pretty much like if you're in the, if you've been in the industry a while, pretty much everybody knows him, but that, the content that that guy put in there is just, it's invaluable. So, you know, books like that, and, and there's a handful of other books. Like I saw Rob was on the show. He wrote, he wrote it. And I mean, it's nice. Like I bought a copy as soon as he um, released it on Amazon and I just got it. He just signed it for me, but you know, it's a little, little book, you know, just like basic forensics, start reading some of those, start watching videos, find some courses to, to pick, go to a community college if they offer. I mean, I don't, honestly, I don't look at the community college list, but I figure that's probably, I well, I know that there's a lot of colleges that have that as a course curriculum. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a ton of online, uh, like Udemy classes too, for programming to start out as well, that you can kind of get an understanding if you're not extremely technical, I think. Yeah computer programming is definitely something really important when you're starting out to kind of understand fundamentally how the programs yeah. are working too. Yeah. And I also think it helps to, um, at least, at least my, my opinion, I also think it helps too to, to get comfortable with command line. Yes. Like a lot of this stuff that a lot of the stuff that these brainiacs that are out there now, like the Jessica types and the Aaron types, like they're just scripting gurus. So like, a lot of the stuff I feel like they're doing, they're scripting it out of like memory, like memory forensics, volatility, all that stuff is all like, you know, to me, it's not all command line, but I feel like it, we got away from command line. Like when I first started, I was in DOS, like I think DOS 3.11. So I was okay with command line, but I think Linux is going to be kind of prevalent. And I think command line's probably going to, we're going to have, people are going to have to start learning a little command line you know, to script data out of these, these, you know, collections that they have. Yeah, I, I see a lot of individuals, um, a lot of junior examiners when we interview candidates that they don't have a lot of experience with command line, but they'll say, um, you know, they have experience with Python. And then when you dig a little deeper, they, uh, they conceptually understand, but I don't think they have a lot of practice with it. And the practice piece is important. Right. Um, and there's a lot of online labs where I think we lost Amy or she lost me. Am I back? I'm back. Am I back? All right. <laughs> Weird. I heard you all. No one heard me. 
So <laughs> not sure what happened. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So um, I think I'm back up. Everyone can hear me. So I don't know where I dropped, but I was saying that um, there's a lot of online labs and stuff. And I think the practice of computer programming and, and that language piece is really important, especially going into it. And there's a ton of free labs and free courses that you can get your hands on or very cheap courses that you can get your hands on. It, and it doesn't have to break the bank if you're just starting out um, right. or if you're or if you've been a seasoned professional for a while and you're going to shift um, into a different you know, niche of digital forensics, you can definitely do that fairly cheap for the most part. So um, D for Diva has a ton of free courses and resources. Um, Jessica Hyde, you had mentioned her. She yeah. has a ton of resources as well that are, you know, on the um, cost wise on the lower side, but the quality is, you know, at the top. So you'll definitely right. be able to pick up and learn from those courses. Yeah, so, definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so no one heard me ask this question, so I'll just repeat it. Um, are there any um, anticipated changes or challenges you see going into the new year? Um, I mean, besides what we talked about with the amount of data, I think I think one of the things, and I'd, I'd like to see it, I, I'm just going to say I, I think there's some companies working on it, or at least I hope they are. One of the things I'd like to see is an organization, like a software company program, the software to use the CUDA cores, like in, in an NVIDIA, like a 4090, a 4090, it's all geeky stuff. But of course, like we're comfortable here in, in this arena. But, you know, the, there's CUDA cores that are in like individual tiny little microprocessors inside of, of a GPU. I mean, there's 16,384 CUDA cores in a, in a 4090. So, I mean, if somebody can figure out how to program their software to use those, you're talking the ability to use 16,000 plus processors to, to run data. And I, I kind of feel like at some point we're going to have to get to that point. Like data is not going away. Forensics isn't going away. We all got freaked out when BitLocker came out. Like we're way past that now. Now we can break through. Now we can get through BitLocker. I know companies are going to introduce more encryption, but I don't, I don't think we're ever going to get to the point where the brains of the community can't figure out how to reverse engineer encryption and get through it or figure out how to process data faster with something like you know a, a graphics card there's some they, you know they also have fpgs that are basically like cards like pcie cards that you would plug into the motherboards i think we need to figure out how to program those and use fpgs as well so yeah to absolutely run then you don't have to yeah you don't have to we have a little eGPU plugin for the for that reason, right? Yeah, right. So that way, some data more needs... power, more better. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, because I mean, it's you know, at some point we're gonna have to we're gonna have to figure out a way. Besides, and I mean, it just is what it is. I'm just gonna say it. Besides buying more and more and more machines, like we're just gonna have to have one or two machines that's fully loaded with like GPUs or. FPGs or I don't know, whatever, whatever other technology that comes out that's out there hardware wise that the community can use to, to go faster. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it'll be interesting now that you just put that tidbit out there. I wonder what will happen. Yeah. I mean, we're already oh. using, we're already using the cards. I mean, the, the Leva folks, they're already using the GPUs. Of course, obviously it's video forensics, but so they have to use a video card, but I mean, they're already heavy on using those cards. So it's just going to take somebody, you know, one of the big manufacturers and man software manufacturers to figure that out. Yeah. Well, someone's going to figure it out. Yeah. Hopefully. And then, and then we'll, and then we'll have another conversation about it and be like, how did you know? <laughs> <laughs> right. So, well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. Uh, before we end, what's your favorite holiday movie? What's your go-to? <laughs> oh, without a doubt, The Night Before with Seth. Oh, Mike, really? Anthony Mackie. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's. I I don't know if I have seen that. Oh, it's like, it's like three guys that that 
were friends since they were little and one of the guy's parents died. So they all get together every year, you know, to make him feel good. So he doesn't feel like he's alone at Christmas and like, this is their last Christmas. And it's one of those, it's kind of like super bad. It's like a whole night full of just craziness. <laughs> just, you know. We have another one for Die Hard. I mean, we, we oh, did yeah. pick that one. Right. There's this whole debate though. Is Die Hard a Christmas movie? Is it not? I don't know. I think it is. I mean, it's always on. <laughs> yeah. I think it is. Somebody else just told me too, Bat the old Batman Returns with Michelle Pfeiffer, Michael Keaton. That's a Christmas yeah. movie because it's set at Christmas time. So I, I, mean, I don't... So it's, it fits all seasons in my opinion, but. Right. <laughs> yeah. Which I appreciate. I like the fact that I got, I got picked for the Die Hard. <laughs> the Die Hard movie because I'm actually out in California. I figured I'd let you guys see the palm trees in the back. They are beautiful. Oh, yeah. So, all right. Well, I will make sure that you don't sweat it um, in your Christmas sweater too too much longer. It's actually I know nice that the cool. weather is beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> you probably don't need the giant sweater on. No, but... not for long. <laughs> I have on shorts. But... <laughs> Well, enjoy. Um, thank you so much for joining us. It was really insightful. And then for everyone listening, um, tomorrow we have Alex Bergoni Briggs uh, joining us on um, the 12 oh, yeah. Days of Deformis. So that'll be good. Yeah, that'll be excellent. So, all right. Well, thank you so much. Right. Appreciate your time. All right. Thank you. All right. All right. See thanks, everyone. Happy holidays. <laughs>